This video was brought to you in part by the supporters of the AMTV Patreon. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome back to AMTV Radio. This is the podcast where I'm joined by a very special guest each time and we chat about whatever the hell we want to, quite frankly. And today I am joined by a actor, a voice actor, a host, an all-rounder sort of guy as we say in the industry. I'm joined today by Mark DiCarlo. How are you doing, Mark? Adam, I'm doing great. How are you? Yes, I'm good, thank you. All is well. Well, I say all is well over here in England. It's never well here in England, as we said before we started recording. We're very good at complaining. Even if it was like the best day ever, there's always something to complain about. But it's all right. It's all right. How's how's things in L.A.? Things in L.A. are great. I would think there's so much more, at least weather-wise, to complain about in London. That's all you guys <laughs> would be doing in Britain is, is complaining about the weather. Honestly, some of our newspaper articles and things that pop up on social media that are considered stories worth complaining about is insane you know it's like oh something goes up in price by like 10 pence and everyone's like what like they can't believe it it's an outrage and you just think come on there's bigger things to worry about but <laughs> yeah we have we have much better big stupid things to worry about here <laughs> oh bless you <laughs> yeah. we've yeah we've uh we've been working on that the last couple of years but yeah uh, there's a well, lot you know, things going are getting on. better yeah, think, as a famous song once said, things can only get better. I'm a big believer of that. So fingers crossed right. that will happen. So, Mark, welcome to the show. And I'm sure some of the listeners and viewers when they watch this will recognize you and some of your work. But for maybe those who aren't too familiar, do you just want to tell us a bit about yourself and what it is you do? Sure. Well, for the past 10 years, I've been the comedy uh, correspondent on a show called Windy City Live out of Chicago, Illinois. And that's a... Uh, it's like a Good Morning America kind of show. And I would go out and do field pieces and mess around with people in the streets. That hasn't been <laughs> happening. No. <laughs> in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, oh, no. The show's been on 10 years. Before that, I was uh, a, a comedian on a show called uh, Taste of America with Mark DiCarlo. And I went to over 400 cities in America and uh, talked to mom and pop restaurants, fancy restaurants, and just uh, learned about the connection between regionalism and food and uh, dishes, you know, why barbecue is popular here and why yeah. rice is popular there. There's always really great stories behind it and really great people. So that was really cool. I used to host a dating show called Studs. Yeah. Uh, and I do a lot of cartoon work. Probably uh, people know me best as uh, the voice of Hugh Neutron, the dad on the Jimmy Neutron show. Yes. That's been going on about the Hugh Nation years. army, as I've seen recently on social That's media. Right. <laughs> Hugh Nation is rising up. It is. It is. And I'm here for it, man. I'm all the way for it. Um, but as you say, you've been working for several years now. You've done all these wonderful things. But um, as an actor myself and for people who might be listening, who maybe will, like, you know, want to get a start in this crazy industry that we work in. Um, what made you want to get into it? Was it something you always wanted to do or was it one of those happy accidents that you fell into it? Um, when I was in high school, I grew up in Chicago. And when I was in high school, my best friend's older siblings were both on the main stage at the Second City, which is uh, uh, it's the Harvard of improv comedy. All the people that uh, come out of um, not all, but uh, many cast members on Saturday Night Live and Mad TV, they all are plucked off the stage at Second City in Chicago. And it sure. was where uh, Viola Spolin and Paul Sills started developing uh, improv comedy as a be all and end all show of its own. Mm -hmm. So I would sneak into these, into Second City when I was underage to watch <laughs> my friend's siblings and they were hilarious. Yeah. And then I found out you actually get paid to just be funny and you don't have to learn any lines. <laughs> yes, I'm like, that yeah. is for me. <laughs> That's the um, one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I, I graduated high school. I came to California. I graduated UCLA. I started my own improv group. And then when Second City formed a theater here in uh, Los Angeles, I was a member of the founding cast with uh, people like um, Megan Cavanaugh and Andy Dick and Brad Sherwood and Colin Mockery and... Andrea Martin was in the show for a while. Rich Kine was in the show for a while. So it was a great uh, 
great place to be from. And uh, I think anyone that's looking to get into, especially comedy, you should take classes. And uh, uh, depending on where you are, I, I don't know what the situation is in London, but in America, um, uh, UCB is a good outfit. The, the Second City is a good outfit here in Los Angeles. The Groundlings are a good outfit. Um, but I think improv, and obviously I'm biased because that's where I came from, but improvising, if you can improvise, you can work anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that was one thing because I trained at drama school in a, in Liverpool over here, and we did a whole like season of imp improvising classes. And I think at first, because we were all quite young, you know, we, we we knew what it was, but we sort of thought, why do we need you know like a whole season of this? Do you know what I mean? It was like, why can't you just tell us how to do it? And but afterwards, we got it because you're right. If you can improvise, you can work yourself out of any situation. If anything goes wrong, you can invent your own material. It's a one. I look. It's a wonderful art form, in my opinion, and one I think still doesn't get maybe as much appreciation as it as it should. I mean, I, what's it like in yeah. America? Is improv still uh, quite a? Is it seen as a bigger thing? Because over here, it's, it's you know, it's seeping, a bit mixed. It's seeping into the mainstream. I think a lot of casting directors look for people with improvising training, just mm. because not not only. It, First of all, it helps you get jobs because you're better at auditions if you can improvise. And yeah. secondly, it teaches the most important. I mean, we're improvising, you and I, right yes, now. I don't know what are. you're going to say next. You don't know yeah. what I'm going to say. The reason it works is because I'm listening to what you say, and then I'm responding yeah. as Mark. If I was improvising as somebody else, I would listen to what you say and respond as a chicken or as a construction <laughs> worker yeah, yeah, or as a cartoon. And, and uh, once you learn how to do that, uh, I, I, I just think it, it it helps all aspects of acting and writing and directing. Um, and it really gets to the core of what acting is. You know, you're, you're supposed to be when you're acting, really living somebody else's life inside your head. Absolutely. You know? yeah. if, if I was a longshoreman in Liverpool and you said <laughs> something to me, I would react differently than if I was a professor at Oxford, right? Absolutely. With, with, with the same stimulus from you. So that's that's what you have to learn how to do. And then, uh, and then you have to be funny. And I, I don't, I, I, I'm curious what you think. I, I don't know if you can teach funny. Mm, I, th I think you can, again, when we, I'm thinking of what I did uh, when we, when I trained, it was like, if we were doing comedies, you know, they would say, you know, obviously this is meant, this is written as like, you know, it's meant to be the punchline or whatever, but yeah, they never said, this is how you make it funny. They just say, there's the punchline now, do, you know, do it i do it's one of those hard things isn't it i think being funny is is a very i think it can be a natural thing i think you can develop it as well as as you learn and as you practice maybe but yeah it's one of those weird natural things i think i mean what do you think is it is it something like you think you've got in you or i think it's like musical talent you mm. can teach anybody to play the guitar but you know there's only one there was only one stevie ray vaughn there's only one Derek trucks Jimi hendrix yeah Every, everyone is born with different abilities. And I think if, uh, I, I, yeah, I think you have to have a certain amount of genetic funny bone in you. And then you can use skill and practice and study to learn how to deploy it more efficiently yeah. or more powerfully. But um, I have a lot of friends, most of them are funny and the ones that aren't funny they're just not funny. And they're, they're just, you know, yeah. it's, it's not that it makes them bad people, but they're no, just no. not funny, you know, no, and, yeah. and they have other skills, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Or whatever. Yeah. And um, I find sometimes you can be funny, you know, without even realizing it. It, it. it sparked a memory when you said about auditions, like, you know, they look for uh, people who can improvise. I, I did an audition once where it was one of those reads where the casting director says, right, I'll read the other character, you know, back to you in response to what you're saying. And I remember it was a sort of a reconciliation scene. And I was appealing to the girl being like, oh, you know, I've changed. I've done all this. Will you come back to me? And I remember my line was, so, you know, will you come back to me? And in the script, it, the girl or the casting director says, yes, I will. And in the audition, I said it and there was a pause and she went, no, I'm not. So then I had to just, as you said, listen to that impulse and I, I just improvise, you know, but, but why I've done, I've done all this for you. I've, I've changed. I've, 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 and it was, I, you know, I said some silly stuff because, you know, sometimes when you improvise, your mind's like, oh, like f finding something. But, but then they said they found it funny because, well, one, I just took, I took it on the chin and went with it. But, 
So I think, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those weird ones, isn't it? Well, you know, I, I liken it to, especially comedy is like music, right? Something, mm. even if you don't understand a language, my, my wife is from Cuba. So all of her relatives speak Spanish, her parents and, and her older relatives. And I could be sitting there in Miami, listening to them talk. And I don't really know what they're saying, yeah. but I know when they say something funny because there's a musicality and a rhythm to it. And I think classically trained people, it's like classical music. They mm -hmm. learn the lines, they learn their character and improv is like jazz. And yeah. it's what you, yeah. what you just described. You have to be nimble and you have to be listening. So if someone changes the direction of the scene, you follow them. And that's how, that's how things, that's how sketches get written. Typically that's how, uh, you know, a, a scene will progress. So if you, if you're able to do that without getting, well, what you do, stopping the audition <laughs> or stopping the scene, I think just from a practical tool belt kind of, you know, actor's toolkit yeah. uh, frame of reference, it's an invaluable skill. Absolutely. And it, it's one I think that they often said the tell was for improvisation. If someone was it, it clearly like, you know, not taking to it well or didn't know how to respond to you, because as I'm sure, you know, you can say some outrageous stuff when you're improvising. It's literally open book. Anything goes. And they always said that the sign that someone isn't like throwing themselves into it is if they shut what you give them down. So if I said to you like, oh, you know, Mark, we're, we're being abducted by aliens and you just sort no, of- No, like, we're not. Yeah, yeah, that's No, it. it's yeah. just a, a flickering light. Exactly, and, yeah. And, and that, that, that's dumb on a variety of reasons, but it stops the momentum of the scene. You're denying yeah. the reality of your kid. It's much more, it's much more entertaining to say, oh yeah, I know. You know why? Because I left the sprinklers on and aliens love water. They're going to come down here. We should get them and then turn off the hose and then yeah. capture them and sell them to the circus. It gives you, yeah. it's called the, the like the, the, the uh, rule, the number one rule is called yes and. Whatever you say is yeah. true and real. And it's up to me to justify it and add another piece of information to it and move the scene along. Absolutely. And uh, just like jazz, if you're on stage with a bunch of musicians, Everyone knows what key you're in. Everyone knows what the what the format of the the phrasing of all the you know the the the, the refrains and the choruses and verses are. And then you play inside of that structure. Mm. And um, it's uh, we we uh, especially on Jimmy Neutron, we had a lot of really good improvisers in that cast. My, the girl that played my wife, um, Megan Cavanaugh, and I were in Second City together. And uh, mm. Jeff. Uh, Jeff Garcia plays Sheen and he's a stand-up and he's good improviser. Bradby Paulson plays um, Carl Weezer. He's a very funny improviser. So we would, uh, whenever we record an episode, we would mm. do a written pass of a scene. Then we would do what we call the fun pass and <laughs> everyone was free to say whatever they wanted. Yeah. You know, oh, in character. That. And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, a good 30% of what we would come up with, they would end up using in the show because it, I love that. It was funny, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jimmy Neutron was always, again, because it was one, as I'm sure you've heard from a lot of people, that was one. I'm, I saw the film when I was about, oh, about five or six. And then, you know, watching the TV show. And I always remember out of all the different cartoons that were on, Jimmy Neutron always had that humor. It was a very inherently funny show. And uh, well, you've, yeah. you've just said if, if some of it was improvised, I think that's great because uh, it was something I was going to ask because I guess when you work in TV and uh, in children's TV I, as, as well for cartoons and such, I know sometimes depending on like the team you're with or, you know, the production team or the directors, sometimes it's very much, I guess, you know, here's the script, you will read the script and that is it. But have you been quite lucky on a lot of your like voiceover projects? Has it been quite as free reign or have you had those directors who are like, no, no, read what's on the page? Uh, I've done both. You know, I've mm. done I've done some movies where there's no other cast members and it's just mm. me reading with the director and then they splice it all together uh, as they see fit later on. Yeah. Um, personally, I like the wide open approach. The way we did Neutron, everyone was in a soundproof clear booth we could all see each other yeah uh, but if i was talking while you were talking it wouldn't be a problem later on um so we we improvised and i i wrote and produced a, a reboot of pinocchio called pinocchio and the pinocchio and the water of life that's coming out next year and we recorded that movie in the same way where we had everybody isolated uh, uh, audio wise but everyone could see each other and we would 
we record it as written you know, as I wrote yeah. it. And yeah. then, you know, the fun surprise parts. me, yeah. come up with, come up with fun stuff. And I think it's a, uh, you if you, especially if you cast your project correctly and certainly on uh, Jimmy Neutron, uh, that was the case. Hmm. You've got six thoroughbreds chained to a microphone. Why would you, you know, why would, why you, would not... you limit them? Yeah. Yeah. It costs nothing. You know, you're yeah. going to, it costs you five minutes of time. And if everything everybody says is crap, you already have the written version that works. Yeah. So I'm always of the mind to um, harvest everybody's best stuff. And then you deal with it in the, uh, in the edit bay, but why, why truncate you know, why limit your opportunities? Now, if you have, a, you know, they're, not everybody improvises. So if you have a voice actor who's just a great voice actor, but doesn't like to improvise, then it's not really an option. But sure. most of the um, the really fun gigs that I've done, it's with people who, you know, they could have a script or they don't, they don't, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, they know how to handle it both ways. Yeah, it's a great way to work, as you said. And uh, well, uh, I'm planning on uh, getting back to more of like your your voiceover stuff and and some of your recent projects as well. But uh, I just want to go back a bit. Let's go back to the the early 1990s, which may <laughs> which isn't that long ago, I suppose, no, depending on how you look at it. And uh, you, as you said a bit earlier, you were the host of a show called Studs, as well as you've hosted a few different shows in, in your time as a as a performer. So. As you, you've talked about, like improvising and like comedy, and then voice acting. So, for a host, I assume so, so on a show like Studs, you might have certain, you know, bits of dialogue you need to read. You know, like I, we're going to break or explaining the rules of what's going on. But did that allow you to be quite free as well, like interacting with the different contestants? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> we it, that was completely improvised. I mean, we had. I would say, you know, welcome to the show. We've got three girls and two guys and they went on dates and there was a, you know, some patter at the top of the show. But then everything that happened after that was uh, I was interviewing five people about six dates. So mm -hmm. I just had to listen. And, you know, sometimes you can hear like if you're interviewing someone and I'm sure you've run into this because you've been yeah. doing this a while. If you ask them a question and they don't answer it, but they say something else. Yeah. There's a reason they didn't answer it. And depending on uh, what you're trying to accomplish with the interview, hmm. sometimes the non-answer is more informative than if someone gives you a straight up answer. And it tells you, oh, there's something embarrassing here to ask them about and hit on it some more, or I better not, or he'll freak out. You know what I mean? There, there's... Um, uh, yeah, it was all improvised. The the uh, at least my stuff was, and, and we had really great producers, and they cast it very well. So the people were always very lively, and mm -hmm. I would have five people to bounce off of. And I figured out if I happened to figure out five minutes into the show that this particular guy was kind of a dud, I would focus more on the other people. Mm, and it was sure. uh, kind of like a hosting boot camp. We did we did six hundred episodes of that show. Wow. <laughs> did it still feel fresh by the time you you finished up or yeah yeah we yeah. were we were number one in our time slot when we got canceled because uh rupert murdoch's wife the owner of fox uh didn't like the show oh right so <laughs> she got him to cancel a hit show uh oh. yeah because it was different every time you know it was different yeah. five people every show uh and there was always and, and you're dealing with people's sex lives and dating and first dates and you know their 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 personalities on the line their yeah handsomeness or prettiness is on the line so there's a lot of energy to tap into in that particular format it was fun yeah do you think it could ever like exist in today's tv landscape do you think if they if they were ever to redo it or i think so i mean i always approach it as a comedy show about dating and in that context yeah. yes i think mm. the difference now is you we've all seen all these reality shows with people on yes. dates and first of all they're not they're the farthest thing from real oh if you're on oh, a yes. date <laughs> and there's four cameras around you you're not yeah. you're acting you're not being real and yeah. there's there's something fun about you and i go down to the pub and we have two couple of pints we yeah. call it a night and someone asked me what i did last night and someone asked you and you're going to get two different stories yeah so by yeah. by placing those over each other you find where the comedy is yeah. and i think that, that i think that always works but people are so used to now seeing you know idiot people 
basically having sex on first dates on some of these shows that <laughs> it, it may seem a little tame. Yeah, no, I mean, we've got this show here in the UK. I don't know if it's come over to the US, but we've got this show called Love Island, which is um, basically, I, I think, it, I mean, I'm not a fan of reality TV, but it's it was in, a few years ago, like the biggest thing in UK TV. It was basically all these couples you know as as you you know perfect people men with great bodies really skinny women not not necessarily real people you know like you you probably wouldn't see people like me or you on shows like that and right. it was just them in this villa on holiday and every week it was oh like you said who's gonna sleep with each other but we don't know each other oh but it's for oh the shock and the horror and like you say it's all um, I mean, we probably know as well because we we work in the industry, but so much of it is fabricated and All pushed of it. to. Yeah, exactly. All Whereas I guess is. with a show like Studs, like you're saying on on your behalf, it's completely improvised. You know, no one's saying, "Oh, Mark, say this, say that." You're just going off what is, be, as you say, being given to you by the by the contestants. Right, it, because it doesn't matter what mm. happened. The specifics don't matter. What what matters is how it's all presented so yeah. we don't need you know we don't need and we're not showing the people making out and the bikinis and all that stuff so it's all it's like radio it's theater of the mind so you know you describing that moment you you see this hot girl for the first time you're like oh my god she was gorgeous she was this i was madly in mm. love then you ask her and she's like eh, i don't really remember <laughs> meeting him and mm. i meet so many guys and they're all oh, they're crawling out. so there, <laughs> yeah. there's inherent um comedy there but yeah reality tv is is i i i I don't understand why the general public still doesn't understand that it's completely fabricated what it it, reality tv became a thing because there was a writer strike here in the u.s so all the scripted dramas that were being that were filling tv at the time shut down and the networks had nothing to buy so they had a invent something and they invented this because there's no writers right legally okay. on these reality shows there's only producers but in reality what the producers do is they'll they'll write scenarios and all right you're going to be the bad guy you know you're the, yep. the naughty boy in the leather jacket and you're going to do this and you know what i heard she said this about you last night now you go yep. in there and the cameras turn yep. on and it's all it's fabricated <laughs> without you're you're basically watching people who don't know how to improvise improvise yeah. So I don't understand yeah. why it's so popular. It's a very strange phenomenon, and I hope it does sort of fade out of the mainstream, but it, no, it's hanging it's, around. No, it never will, because it's inexpensive to produce. And like yeah. you just said, people watch it. So that, yeah. What, yeah. whether people watch it knowing that it's all false and phony, or they don't care, or I, I don't understand. I, I don't really watch it myself. No. But it, it's popular, and it's cheap to make, which really is all show business cares about. It's all back to the money. That's always back to the money. Well, let's Although, talk I'll, about- I'll tell you what, though. Uh, Animaniacs just went back into production last it did. year, right? It did, yeah. That's the opposite. Uh, mm. uh, my friend Rob, a couple of my friends work on that show, and Steven Spielberg committed to full... He scores every episode musically, top to bottom, just like the old Looney Tune um, okay. cartoons. Yeah. And they record at Warner Brothers, and they spend a lot of money on that show, and you see it. It's a quality mm. piece of work, right? And and his, his idea is I want these cartoons to still be funny 50 years from now, like Bugs Bunny is 50, uh, still yeah, funny yeah. 70 years later. That, so it, there's, there's, still a, there's still a place for quality TV. It's just that there's also a place for cheap, schlocky TV. And, you know, people yeah. watch it. I suppose it's the two sides of the coin, isn't it? I suppose yeah. they coexist with each other. But... On a show that I think is of a much higher quality, we've already mentioned it a bit, but let's talk Jimmy Neutron. So All right. you, Good segue. of course, th- thank you very much. <laughs> <So, laughs> I try, as I'm sure you know, when you're hosting or like anything like that, you have to find these segue moments where you go, oh, there's a moment, right? Let's do it. Because I've seen some interviews where the segues are just very awkward. You know, they'll be talking about one thing and then out of nowhere, the host will be like, right now this and you're like whoa hang on like what and that's a lack of listening that's a lack of the understanding of improvising what you're doing now uh, you may have some questions written down on a piece of paper but you're we're following each other's what we're talking about and that's why the conversation just keeps flowing Mm. uh, uh, uh seamlessly and 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 
people that don't know how to improvise do have a hard time doing that because they're not really listening to you. They're thinking about, oh, what's my what's my next question? What's that they have? As soon as yeah. I stop hearing the noise from his pie hole, I'm going to ask <laughs> what it, the next thing is on this piece of paper. And it's not as good, in my opinion. Yes, no, no, of course. So now that I've screwed up your beautifully smooth no, segue, it's, it's okay. what was your we're, question? We're giving we're giving a masterclass to people out there who <laughs> want to do this to be like this is this is how to do yeah. it. So so yeah, Jimmy Neutron. It's probably you know it's how I was introduced to I guess yourself as a performer when I was a kid and a lot of people of my generation as well. So of mm -hmm. course you had the the film was first the uh, the feature length film. So with your involvement then, was it, were you traditionally auditioned or did someone reach out and say, hey, Mark, can you come and voice this for me? How, how did you get involved with Jimmy Neutron, I suppose? Uh, actually, what happened was I, uh, I, had, I had gotten out of college and I had started my own improv group because there was no second city in California at the time. And we had, uh, the group was called the Frayed Knots, a lot of funny guys, a lot of funny people in it. And we had a standing gig Wednesday nights at a comedy club in Long Beach, uh, Friday nights at a comedy club in Hollywood, another one in Los Angeles. So we had like residencies at three or four different clubs around town. And we, we would go and do a 90 minute show three or four nights a week. Yeah. And some guy came in one time and saw us and thought we were funny and invited us to do a pilot down. He was a, uh, uh, he was a producer at a local college that had a really strong, um, uh, production department so mm -hmm. we went and we made a pilot with him and then it turns out he was friends with this guy named steve odenkirk who had an idea to do this show called johnny quasar and he did a little two or three minute uh sizzle reel where it's a, it's a, the dad talking to the boy about how it's bad to play with rockets and he could have killed somebody so we made that little thing um steve odenkirk and paul marshall this this producer took it to uh took it to Paramount, I think. Paramount mm -hmm. loved it. They said, we want to do a movie. We started doing the movie. While we were making the movie, they liked what they saw and were hearing so much, they decided we're going to do a TV show too. Oh, wow. So we, we recorded the movie. They started doing the animation. The movie came out in, um, I think it came out at Christmas of 01 or 02. Yes, I think so, yeah. And then, and then July, the following July, the TV series was on the air. So I think we were we were working on rec voice records for the episodes before the movie even came out, which is wow. very, very um, rare. Yeah, because I was going to say that must have shown, I guess Paramount must have, as you said, had a lot of faith in the quality of the product. If they said, yeah, let's do a TV show before the movie had even even hit theaters. Yeah, it was it was a really big departure at the time because back then, the nerdy kid in any cast was always the butt of the joke. Yes. Right. Yeah. Nerd. You, yeah. you like science. You're an idiot. You believe in vaccines. You're an idiot. <laughs> uh, things have changed so much. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and so Jimmy was, Jimmy was the first lead. The uh, first time it was cool for a kid to be a science nerd. Hmm. And, and, and that, that, that kind of put a really different spin on the show and, uh, opened it up to uh, people loved it and, and I think also we intentionally made a show for kids mm. that adults would also find funny absolutely so if you go back and watch some of the episodes you remember from when you were a little kid you're gonna now you're gonna hear the same lines and you're gonna go oh that was a grown-up joke and yeah. I didn't get it and, yeah. and that's really very uh, uh, it's a great strategy for doing animation because Kids watch the animation, but the adults have to watch it with their kids too. So if it sucks, the, the adults won't push that. You know, oh, let's go watch Rick and Morty instead. Sure, right? and, yeah. And and I think that was I don't know if that was intentional or not, but that's certainly how it worked out. That um, uh, we had a lot of funny stuff in there for for fans of all ages. Yeah, I think it's absolutely the best kind of, uh, well, just best kind of film or TV series, really. You know, it's the ones that, are, like you say, appeal to all audiences, whether the comedy is uh, visual or via audio or or anything. If it's if it's timeless and appeals to all ages, then it's great. I mean, I remember, again, when I was really young, about five or six, it was around the same time as the Jimmy Neutron film, I think. I do remember one of my earliest memories is seeing Shrek, the first one in the cinema, 
and I know Same my year. Pet. We were both nominated for Best Picture, and Shrek won that year. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I yeah, that's my... a great example. Mm, and my parents came with me, and and you know, when your parents and you take your little kids to see, in you know, in quotes, the kids movie, you're probably thinking, oh, we, you know, here we go. I've got to sit here for ninety minutes and watch da 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 da. But I remember we came out, and they both were like, "That was great," you know, because it had, like you say, that those jokes, those moments that only adults would laugh at. And Jimmy Neutron was very much in that same vein. Yeah, that was our that was our goal to do that, and and it's difficult because, mm. um, like you say, there, there's different there's phys- physical humor, there's visual humor, there's uh, wordplay humor, and to get all that stuff to jive on two different levels is um, uh, it's difficult. But boy, when you can do it, it's a recipe for success because you're just on a, a bean counting perspective, you're increasing the size of the market that will respond favorably to your offering. Absolutely. Right? It's not just kids. It's, it's more people, which will make it more successful. Yeah. So when and you Shrek, went, Shrek did an excellent job of that too. It did. It absolutely did. And when, when you, when you crafted Hugh as, as you know, for anyone who doesn't know, like you said earlier, when you're an actor, you're living out someone else's life, uh, you know, through you and you have to craft it all. What what was your process for Hugh? Did Or were you given like a, here's a brief outline of what he's like and you fill in the gaps? No, no. What they do is they, they show you a picture. So they'll show you a picture <laughs> of the character, right? There he is. And, um, and they go, all right, we'll come up with a voice. I, I think I did audition for this, but I, I my friend Paul Marshall uh, got me in myself and the woman who played Judy, my mm-hmm. friend Megan, we read together, which was really important because we were bouncing off each other. Yeah. I just thought it would be funny because the kid is so smart if the dad was a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah. So he's always fumbling for, for his words and he doesn't understand anything at all. And uh, the kid is always the smarter one. And <laughs> that was also, I thought, kind of a change up. You know, typically most parents in sitcoms or cartoons are the authority figure they they they're in charge and yeah. i don't think anybody would let hugh neutron be in charge of anything <laughs> except maybe a pie eating contest i think he'd be good at that but otherwise Absolutely. no yeah and and that's why i think his, his character that you created is so endearing because like you say i guess a lot of the like you said a lot of the cartoons at that time and still today to some extent the parents are the authority figure it's the the ones to rebel against and seeing even that my some of my favorite hugh moments are the moments where you know judy's trying to get him to like tell jimmy off or give him a lecture and he's he, he tries bless him you know he tries to do the whole serious straight talking but then it, it you know he either fumbles it up or he comes out with a great gag and i love those moments because those were moments i didn't necessarily see from my parents as you say like not the typical authority figure and it was it was refreshing to see something like that yeah obviously he loved his family and obviously mm. he wants to be a good dad but he's just not um I don't know if he's not bright. I think he's easily distracted. He's like a hummingbird. Yeah. You know, he could be talking, oh, squirrel. He was just yeah. always very easily uh, distracted. And I thought that was funny. For uh, He has a kid who has the most focused mind in town. And mm. meanwhile, he was just whatever <laughs> is shaking or sparkly, he gravitates towards in a very uh, childlike way, I guess. And it was yeah. just, you know, it just fun. It was able... It, it brought a lot of funny mojo into the relationship in the family relationship. So I think it, and it just, you know, once you start doing that, the writers write to it and it just expands. Absolutely. It just, and I think when you watch the TV show, like, as you say, like the later you go on, I think you see that in some of the jokes and some of the scenes, you can tell that the writers are catering more to you and then you're bouncing off each other, like you said, and it all, it all just works. And I think, what else I think propelled Jimmy Neutron, at least for me, was obviously 3D animation at that time was still quite new, I suppose. And it was very new. Yeah. I think we yeah. were the f- first one on yeah. Nickelodeon to use that technology. Yeah. And now they all use it. So so you were all trailblazers in a way, because it's now the yeah. almost the standard now, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, it's yeah. it's the the most economical way to do that kind of animation. The animation uh, I, I'm also in, uh, involved in a project called Bafo the Bear, and that's real-time motion capture animation, where I have uh, 
I have a, a, a partner who's developed this system where basically we put a little camera on my face and my face alone drives this big blue cartoon bear. Wow. And it's instantaneous. We could do it live to air. We've been doing it. We started doing it during the pandemic on a YouTube channel, Bafo the Bear. And I would interview people just like you're interviewing me, but it would be a bear talking to a person in real time. And it's never been, never been possible before. And I think this, wow. this technology, this real-time motion capture technology is going to be the next uh, evolution of animation for television, uh, almost certainly, and, and possibly for movies. A lot, of, a lot of video games use it to capture body movements and they things. They do. But the technology's gotten so good with the the nuance that you can get in the face that it, it's seeping into um, mainstream even more. Yeah. So if Nickelodeon maybe say, hey, let's do a Jimmy Neutron reboot, do you think maybe you'd get them to use this this new motion capture? I think they could. We could, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot less expensive than doing it. You know, typically we would record the radio play for an episode and then nine months later, it nine would be- Nine months? ready to put on TV. Yeah, we, we, we were still recording. We had recorded the movie. We were recording the early episodes of the first season and we had never seen our characters <laughs> animated, Blimey. right? We'd seen the pictures and we had seen some, we had probably seen some uh, animatics, but we hadn't, we didn't know what it was gonna be like. So when the, first, when the show first came on the air and we could see what they were doing, then I think that upped everybody's game as to uh, how to get more into their characters. But for, you know, first three years, we were in the dark uh, as what it's going to look like. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's just fascinating, isn't it? How, well, like you just broken down there, how that process is. Because I think, well, you know, mm -hmm. when you're a kid, you're seeing it. And I think, I think, you know, I just assumed, oh, you know, they, they sit down and they write the script and then they tap a few keys on a computer keyboard. And there it is. You know, I guess you don't, you don't necessarily as a kid appreciate the amount of time and effort and the, just well, the whole process, and you, shouldn't. you know? Yeah. No, not, not as a kid. Kids don't no. care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, we had very talented uh, directors and writers on the show. Everyone, you know, I think that's another aspect of it. Uh, we lucked out. Like everybody mm -hmm. that was in the project was at the top of their game and, and very, very talented. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the final product is bigger than the sum of its parts. But yeah, there's a lot of, I think animation acting is the best, most enjoyable, at least for me, part of show business because literally anything you can think of, you can do for the same, it, it, it would cost the same amount of money to animate a character sitting at a desk mm -hmm. as it would flying through the galaxy or destroying a bunch of villains. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it, it really caters to um the imagination. I mean, uh, one of my favorite shows, if not my absolute favorite show right now is Rick and Morty because it's great show. It's they're out of their minds <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And yet they somehow they go everywhere and then they land it at the end of every half hour. It all makes sense. And it's really, really cleverly done. And that's um, it's it's hard to do. And, and they're doing they're doing basically cell animation. So it's 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 CGI, but it's still 2D and um, still fantastic stuff. Yeah, I think Rick and Morty is the latest in, in the line of those sort of great animated shows in the style of like, you know, that you had the Simpsons like in the night. Well, still now, but arguably yeah. their peak in the 90s and things like Family Guy and all those sorts of programs like that, like you say, you have where they just go mad. You know, they do things where at first you go, hang on. Why are they doing that? But then at the end of the day, it, it all works. You don't really question it. You're like, okay, we're doing this now. You know, one minute we're having a cup of tea and now we're off in space fighting interdimensional monsters. You know, that's right. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And you, it's it, it also really leans into the art form of animation. You couldn't, I mean, you could not do Rick and Morty as a live action show. Oh, it no. would be a billion dollar budget every week. Yet as for what they're doing, for the show they're doing, they're able to get all this crazy stuff into it, and it's and it all works. And 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 it's um, you know I think it's state of the art animation comedy right now. And it the um, I think because of the internet and because of social media, animation is becoming a bigger and bigger percentage of the totality of the comedy universe. And I think sure. it's specifically because of 
uh, people like Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon creating stuff like that. And also the, the technology to do the work is become democratized and people can do it. I, I just did something with uh, a guy who's very popular on uh, the YouTube uh, called uh, The Uncle Al Show. And yes. he, he animates his own stuff. He, he does his own, he wanted to be a voice actor and he lives in Pennsylvania. And at some point he said, you know what, screw it. I'm gonna do my own animation. So he would voice characters from other shows. He's made up his own characters. He's got animators that he works with. And you're able to do decent to really good looking animation in your house. Yeah. I, I mean, it's unprecedented what's and what's happening. It's really, it's lit the fuse on what I think is gonna be a really big uh, boom. Yeah, it's so exciting how accessible all these things have become, even like for, for what I do, making videos on YouTube, right. you know, this sort of editing, I mean, the editing software that I use, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I wouldn't have access to something like that, not unless I had thousands of pounds I could, you know, splash out on a proper thing. Whereas now, you know, you buy a new computer, it usually has some editing software, even if it's basic, it's built in, it allows people to do this. And I think, right. I think it's really great. It's that accessibility. Sure, maybe not everything is up to like, you know, a TV standard, especially if you, you know, when you start out, you're finding your feet, you're practicing. But I think even just allowing these people to to practice, to give it a go is is such an important thing. Yeah, and it's, I mean, 20 years ago, just a simple editing suite would be a hundred thousand US dollars. Yeah. Now, like you said, it comes built into the cheapest laptop there is. And I mm -hmm. think what that's done is it's allowed anybody who wants to do this kind of stuff, all right, do it. Yeah. Go get yourself a, a YouTube channel and do it. And it's either going to be crap, it'll be crap, and you'll <laughs> yeah. get better. Yeah. And you know, it's it it really um there's a billions of people on this planet. There are millions, hundreds of millions of creative people. And basically now there's a toolbox that is accessible to everyone. And the the the, the, this the variety of stuff that's out there that is good is staggering. It's totally different than when I started in show business. You know, when I started, you had to audition for these three networks and you had to get picked and then you would get on a show and you would get famous and then you could do other things. Now, like uh, Uncle Al show, he lives in Pennsylvania and he gets more views of his literally made in his basement cartoons than <laughs> most of the shows on uh, Nickelodeon and on other cartoon networks. He gets hundreds of thousands of views per episode. Yeah. Power that, to the people. That's right. Like, power yeah. To the people. It, it's, yeah. And you get all the diversity, you get all these different voices and you know, a lot of it's crap, but there's, there's a lot more cream rising to the top now that it's not controlled by six guys, you know, in Burbank, California. Yeah, it's that opening up, isn't it? Not letting the same moguls or same people dominate everything. Cause I know that's a, I think that's a worry with what, well, at least in the UK anyway, um, the industry here, like especially the TV industry still, the, there's been lots of calls, you know, like you say, make it more accessible, make it more diverse, let's see more kinds of people. And of course, you know, a lot of the broadcasters and companies say, yes, you know, we're, we're fully committed, let's do it. But then when you see what they still put out on TV, you know, it's the same kind of people. It's the same faces popping up. And I'm not saying you shouldn't work with who you who you like. Of course, that's it's expected. But do you know what I mean? It's that it's that lack of seeing different faces, hearing different voices as well. For a long time in this country, um, well, a bit for, between like the 60s and maybe the late 80s, most English voices uh, were that, you know, very, oh, hello, you know, Queen's English you know, very, very posh. Whereas, yes, now it's better. You hear voices like mine on there, but it took a long time. And just like you say, with, with animation now and doing it yourself, you can have those voices right off the bat. You don't have to go through the rigmarole of someone saying, okay, do it again, but don't use your accent. Because I, I I, just find that, well, depending on how it's said, I can find that a bit demeaning. You know, if it's said in the yeah. sense of, we don't want to hear your voice, we want to hear a voice that isn't inherently yours sort of thing. Right, my my as as I said before, my wife is from Cuba. She's also the the biggest span female Spanish voice actor in America in Los Angeles. Oh, wow, uh, she's the voice of the Disneyland parks. So, uh, telling you to keep your arms and hands inside the ride in Spanish. Oh, so nice. All you Spanish speakers that still have all your limbs, you have Manny <laughs> Alvarez to thank. Uh, and she was doing a gig uh, a month or two ago, and 
um, an, a gig in English and she's got a little bit of an accent. And the guy said, right, try it again and uh, try not to sound as a Latina. So she did it again and whitewashed it. And then he says to her, there, that's great. We made you a little more American. And it really, it, it bothered her that that was the, the bench, yeah. the, you know, the goal is to whitewash everything. But that's, I think that's, that genie's out of the bottle. The internet is, anybody could do whatever they want on the internet. And yep. people your age and older don't watch television. Yeah. Old people watch television. Young people watch YouTube and Twitch and uh, social media feeds. And that's where what's happening is the advertising business is trying to figure out a way to do what they do on television on the internet. And they're starting to figure it out and all the budgets are moving to the internet. So I think television yeah. as we know it, it will be gone in 10 years, just, and it'll be something else. Yeah. I don't well, know I why, know it, it, but it'll be something else. Yeah. Well, I know in the U S obviously things like cable, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, I guess were seen as such a, you know, a big thing, all these new channels, all these new options. But I, I mean, I've heard and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I've heard in the last few years, people are saying, oh, you know, cable's dying, they're losing subscriptions and they don't know how to hold on. And it, is it that thing you just said about it's people not choosing to watch traditional television? I can watch whatever I want for free on the internet if I want to go look for it, right? Yeah. And I, if I want to watch six second videos, I know where I can go watch that. The, the cable has morphed into streaming. Mm. So now instead of having to watch Rick and Morty at midnight on Sundays, I can watch it whenever I feel like it. Yeah. So that, that, and that's not going to change. And, and that became a necessity because of people's internet habits. Mm. If you send me a video, I want to watch it now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. I'm going to watch it now, now, yeah. now. It's so convenience, that, isn't it? As well? it, it is convenient. I think what it's done is it's taken away any kind of communal experience that television used to provide. Like here mm. in the States, Johnny Carson, the Tonight Show was on for 33, 30 years. And if something happened funny on Johnny Carson Monday night, 50% of the country was talking about it Tuesday morning. There's yeah. outside of the Super Bowl or big sports events, World Cup, stuff like that. That aspect of broadcasting, I think, is gone now. Now you yeah. hear, oh, I'm binging this, I'm binging that. Have you seen that? There's a billion shows. How are you supposed to keep up with it all? So it's weird, but uh, TV, old school TV, yeah. yeah, it's it it's, happening it's, anymore. It's losing. Yeah, I think over here. I mean, I know it's shown in the states. We've got one or two shows that are trying to, I guess, hang on to. Like, I mean, I'm a big fan of a a show called Doctor Who, uh, a sci-fi show that's ran for sure. over 50 years, and it was. And even now, they still decide to broadcast. You know, one episode a week uh, with cliffhangers and all that sort of stuff. And I'd say probably from from just off the top of my head here in the UK, that's probably maybe the only show that's that I can think of, you know, that still sort of commands that feeling that you said of like, you know, communal, right? Let's all sit down to watch it. It's on at this time. Well, what, and I, I think it, if they took that away, you know, if they moved it to right, the whole season is available now to, you know, binge. I think you just lose something special there because there is something special about watching something once a week and like you say having talking about it with everyone for a week what's going to happen what happened here i think there's something really magical about that i know that's yeah. a bit corny but it is it's it was a magical magical feeling well and especially with doctor who because that show is trippy as well yes it takes, yeah. you, you know you have to sometimes watch it more than once and then think about it it's not just mm. ah, 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 in your face noise and then you go on to the next thing it helps to to ruminate on it and, and go, wow, that was really funny. And then you talk to your friends about it. And, it. and like you said, it's a communal thing. And I think the reason that's still available is specifically because Doctor Who's been on the air for so long and it's been uh, a weird show yeah. comparatively to everything else for so long that it's earned that right and people aren't gonna bitch about it. But anything yeah. new, they dump a whole season. And I always yeah. feel bad, you know, people work for a year and a half to create these six hours of TV and people blow through it in a weekend while they're watching something else and eating dinner. And it's not respectful yeah. of the material sometimes, you know? Yeah, it gets overlooked sometimes, I, I feel. Yeah. But then I think I think sometimes now, and I'd, I'd be interested to see if it's like this in the US, but at least here in the UK, they find the genres of these new shows that work. And then they like, 
people here in the UK love police dramas, you know, detective stuff. And it seems every week, if I'm ever flicking on the BBC, it'll be, look, new new police drama starts tonight. And I just think, I- I'm sure they're different. And I'm sure, you know, the writers have really worked on it. But just how they market it, they market it almost. It's like, it's like the same show you watched last week, but it's a little bit different. And I just think, whilst that may be safe, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's necessarily interesting. It's not pushing the boat out of what you can show to people. But I don't know what it's like in the US with... New it's the same, on, but yeah. what, and what you're describing is programming for older people who mm. want that familiarity and want that sameness uh, because it's comforting. Young people don't care, right? Mm. You, they, they, they'll watch whatever as long as it's entertaining. And yeah. I think TV is understanding that they've lost, TV knows that 20 year olds aren't watching TV. So they're trying to cater to 50 and 60 year olds who do still watch TV. And, mm. which is a huge change. It used to be in TV, you wanted 25 year old people to watch. And when they had no alternative, they did. But now that they do, you know, yeah. this, that's what they're watching all the time. So, yeah. so by saying, hey, this is just like what you like, but it's a little different. Yeah. Come back and watch it. Come back, please. <laughs> we yeah. need the advertisers. <laughs> right, I mean, would Python be greenlit on television today? Well, I mean, You'd like it would to be, think so, but maybe no, I not. I think it would be a streamer. It would be it would be on an upstart network of other edgy stuff, and that's mm. where you'd find it. I think it's it would be too uh, too outland. I mean, it's still outlandish, you know, yeah. <laughs> fifty <laughs> years later. But yeah. it, it it the I think the best material that I'm seeing anyway is on the 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 paid TV streaming services. You know, Hulu and, and Amazon and Netflix and. Um, yeah, well, it'll be HBO interesting Max to see, like you say, stuff. in 10 years, we'll see if we'll see how traditional TV is then. But yeah, I think it is going the way of the dodo, unfortunately. But um, one medium that I don't think is going that way is the realm of video games, which has only seemed to go from strength to strength as the decades have gone on. And I just wanted to bring up the uh, earlier this year, a few months ago, there was this immense viral campaign, wasn't there? Nickelodeon <laughs> announced they were doing this. A fighting game, All Stars Brawl, I think, where all these Nickelodeon characters are gonna, you can come and fight each other because that's what we all want, apparently. And right. sit, and out of nowhere, everyone sit. They want Hugh. They want Hugh in this game, and I guess that's where was that where the Hugh Nation hashtag started. Yeah, I've been like I told you earlier. I've been working on this Baffo the Bear uh, cartoon, uh, this real time cartoon, and I have a producer, a young guy helping me, uh, who's very tied into the internet and stuff like that. And uh, like a month ago, he sends me this link saying, hey, people, Hugh Neutron is blowing up all over Nickelodeon because <laughs> people want Hugh to be in this game. Yeah. So I send one one tweet like, hey, as Hugh, yeah, I would yeah. love to do it. It sounds like it would be crazy. And I'd kick some donkey butt or whatever I said. <laughs> yeah. And literally in the space of three days, I had 40,000 more followers on no Twitter. Way. And it just it blew up. <laughs> and so people started sending me requests. Hey, could you record this? You record that. And I did. And it blew their minds. It was hilarious. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I love it that people, I had no idea that he was as popular uh, <laughs> as he is evidently, but uh, it really touched a chord and it's really shown me personally, the power of um, social media, what happens when, you know, you you strike a chord with people and uh, you engage back with them, hmm. people lose their minds. And and yeah. in, in a really, really good way, it got to the point I was getting, I got like 3000 DMs in a week Blimey. asking me to record <laughs> this or that. So I had to join uh, this cameo service because yes, they yeah. organize it for you. And I'm doing these cameos and people are so thrilled. Oh, thank you. Changed my life. You said happy birthday to my mom. And it's really, uh, uh, it's been really fun. A lot of my other friends do it too. And it's, it's, it's fun to connect with um, fans on a really personal level. Because at first I thought, that's kind of dumb. You know, (laughs) it's just, why do they want me to say this? (laughs) Right. And then I'm thinking if I had had the chance to email Mel Blank when I was 10 years old and have him do a Bugs Bunny voice for me, yeah. I would have lost my fucking mind. Yeah. 
uh, and oh, not that imagine. please only, do not <laughs> do not i am not comparing myself to the greatest voice actor who has ever or will ever live in any case <laughs> but i i I, I I get it, right? I get why. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. If you think I'm great, go watch Bugs Bunny. Well, <laughs> is oh, what absolutely. I should tell people. Absolutely timeless stuff, the Looney Tunes. But um, I, I mean, just to add to what you've said, I mean, if you'd have told six year old me, like, hey, one day you'll you'll interview uh, Mark DiCarlo voice, that would have blown my six year old. Like, like, no way. It's just right. It, yeah. It, but it's true. It's that. You know, Hugh Neutron, I mean, many of those characters on Jimmy Neutron, I think it's fair to say, particularly with, I think, my generation, but older ones as well, it did strike that chord with people. You know, I was a kid who was a bit, a bit shy, also a bit nerdy, sciencey. So, you know, Jimmy struck a chord with me. It's like, oh, I can, I can have, it sounds silly, but, you know, I can make friends. I can do, I right. can do people stuff. People aren't always going to be making fun of me. It's yes. What I do is cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you had the the comedy with like you know yourself and and, and the more adult and uh, the uh, the older characters I should say and like Carl and Sheen and, and it all you know. And I think people remember memories like that because it's it's special. Again, sounds corny, but it's true. It's special. It's special to them. So I I can absolutely see why so many people got in touch and and said, oh, you know, I love your work and and can you record this? But um. I have to, has it been confirmed? Is Hugh going in the game or is that still up in the air? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm not really a big video gamer, so I don't know what the deal is. I don't think they've settled on all the characters. I know there's been a big, there's been a huge outpouring of people pestering Nickelodeon about it. So <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, yeah, I'd be into it. I, I think it's, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's funny. And I, it's just been, um, the exact same thing happened to me. I was a huge fan of the Batman TV series when I was a little, little kid with Adam West, you know, oh, the, the, the live show. action Batman, great right? Show, yeah. And they had the Batmobile, which was the coolest car in the world. Hmm. Fast forward to now, my cousin in Chicago is a car collector and he bought no. one of the original <gasps> Batmobiles. Oh, there were five. Man. Yeah. Marv owns one of them. <laughs> so... I he oh. we I was in Chicago a month ago for a wedding. My wife didn't know this was going to happen. He comes to the airport and picks us up from the airport <laughs> in the friggin' Batmobile. <laughs> yes, it, it blew her mind. Just sit, we're sitting in the Batmobile, and I'm like, if you had told seven year old Mark this, I would have lost my mind. Oh my goodness! So I think it's you know if I can be somebody's Batmobile, I get it. <laughs> and I'm I'm thrilled to be someone's Batmobile. That, that's what a great analogy. I'm, I'm proud to be someone's Batmobile. Wonderful analogy, right? Oh, yeah, I mean it's it's great to be part of something that has that kind of impact uh, on people. And who am I to judge that it's you know I can talk to me whenever I want. It's not that big of a deal. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And I guess um well we've already touched upon it a bit, but before we round off, I was gonna say you know. As we've said, Hugh Neutron and yourself, the work you've done has struck a chord with all these people who have reached out and and, and told you that. Um, when I bet, did you think when you first, you know, did Jimmy Neutron all nearly, well, I think around 20 years ago, could, did you ever no. imagine how how much it would impact people? No, I mean, you know, you always hope. But, yeah. um, uh, and once I saw the movie and I saw how good it was and... Uh, started working with the cast and the writers and the producers that we have. I've done a lot of different shows and mm. the, clearly this show is uh, uh, exceptionally well made by exceptionally mm. clever and funny people. So yeah. we all thought it had a chance. And when it really did start to resonate with people, it really made us uh, feel good. And then you, you embrace that direction and you do even more of that stuff. And I think it was a, a really great, a creative period for animation and for us in in, in specifics to really uh, do that. So did we know that we were working on a really good show that was better than most other experiences that we had? Yes. Did yeah. we know it would be this popular? And, and you know, uh, no, you know, you no. never do. Some things you think should, don't, and, you know, yeah. it's a crapshoot. Yeah. Yeah, it's a crapshoot, absolutely. But um, I mean, I think it's fair to say if if Nickelodeon did turn around tomorrow and said, right, we're doing a Jimmy Neutron reboot, would you be up for it? Oh, we all would. Yeah. 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 Oh, we, we 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 got we got cut off. There were other 
everyone wanted to do more when they canceled yeah. it the first time around. And mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe this uh, energy with the, the all-star brawl and all this social media stuff that may be opening Nickelodeon's eyes to, I don't know. I hope so. We sure would all I like to so. go back and do it again. It was a, uh, it was a fun, fun time with a really fun group of people. Well, I think that further speaks to the quality. The fact that you say that all of you, not just yourself, all of you want to go back and, and do more. You know, you sometimes you talk to actors when they've done a show, oh, would you do that again? And they go, no, like straight, you know, not in no way. But the fact you all want to, I think that speaks volumes about how how good this show is. We would go in every Friday and we'd work for four hours. And the hardest part about it was not laughing all <laughs> yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, when you're working with <laughs> every once in a while, Robbie Paulson, who plays Carl Weezer, would just look at me through the window and go, Jesus helps me trick people. <laughs> just out of the blue, say weird, crazy shit. Yeah. And, uh, we, we, had a, we had a great time. And it was uh, when we did our crazy passes, it was like, all right, everyone was gunning for everybody else. Yeah. I, I'm just going to torch you on this one. Yeah. Um, and we could, because if you, I made you laugh, you, you wouldn't ruin my take. I would just see you laugh and that would make me feel good. But we, yeah. you know, we could edit your voice out. So it was really an enjoyable experience with really talented, talented uh, people. We were all, we all consider ourselves lucky to have um, done it. And we, uh, we hope we do more. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you all got to have that experience. And like you say, fingers crossed, if if, if anyone, any of you listening, if you're, you know, if you work at Nickelodeon, you know, just, you want to nudge some, you know, nudge some elbows and be like, hey, you know. Nudge, nudge, I, I say uh, no yeah. more, hey, yeah. governor. Yeah, hey, governor, that's right. You know, oh, I heard that Jimmy Neutron's pretty popular, you know what I'm saying? You know, just <laughs> any help. But yeah, no, well, Mark, this has been it's been a fantastic opportunity to talk with you. So, I mean, thank you very much for making six-year-old Adam's heart just, like, explode. <laughs> so it's been lovely. Um, uh, it was a pleasure talking to you, reaching across the pond and, and speaking with you. I'm glad I could be your Batmobile, Adam. You you were my Batmobile, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Now I'm going to use that now. That's a great analogy. It is yours. Um, you can have the UK rights. That's all The UK you. rights. <laughs> Only in the UK. Nowhere else. Um, <laughs> but just before you go, as I do with all my guests, if you'd like to shout out any of your work or your social medias, anything like that, please feel free to do so. Uh, I'm Mark DiCarlo uh, on Twitter. I'm Mark DiCarlo TV on Instagram. Um, and the Bafo the Bear show is the Bafo the Bear on YouTube. And what else is going on? Uh, that's And the uh, Pinocchio and the Water of Life comes out in uh, probably spring or summer of 22. And it's got a great cast. Uh, Tom Kenny plays Pinocchio. He's the voice of SpongeBob. Yes, um, nice. Fred Tattashore, the voice of the Hulk, plays the bad guy. Uh, <laughs> Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche, the guys behind Pinky and the Brain, play two funny rats in the movie. Susie Nakamura's in it. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving people out. Uh, uh, Phil Lamar plays a, 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 a Russian moose who juggles. Um, of course. <laughs> really, really fun group of people. A uh, fun group of people. And that's... Um, that's next year. So we're finishing, we're, we're doing the animation on that now. And uh, this real time motion capture animation stuff with Bafo and other characters is really what I'm focused on now. And it's, sure. it's really fun. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, well, everyone listening, go and check out Mark on social media, keep an eye on those projects. I'm a big fan of like the Pinocchio character. So that project you're working on that's coming out next year, I'm going to be tuning into that. I wish you every success with it. You and the team. And uh, now I've always got to remember my links, which is the hardest part of the show, funnily enough. I should write this down, but I don't. So, improvising. Here we go. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you very much. Uh, please leave a like, leave your comments, love to hear your feedback, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple Music, all of the audio streaming sites, you can follow, you can watch. They've all got a different word. It basically means the same thing. You see that button? Give it a click. We've got new episodes every week. And yeah, that's me. So all that's left to be said is, Mark, thank you so much again for coming on. Adam, thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, uh, I wish you the best of success with your show. It's fantastic. And I was uh, uh, honored to be on it. Thank you very much. That means a lot, Mark. Thank you very much. And to everyone who is listening and watching, I will see you in the next one.